And good afternoon. I'm Jeff Jarman, President of the Faculty Senate. I'm joined by Julie Scott, President of UP Senate, and Matt Houston, President of the USS Senate. And we are really glad that so many of you have taken uh, time to join us in the first of a series of town hall events. Uh, today's town hall is for faculty, staff, and the larger WSU community. And we want to thank President Golden and Provost Muma for joining us. We're glad that you are here and took time to, to talk to us. Before we start, let me take one brief moment to thank you all for what you've done for the university over the last few months. This has really been one of the most trying times in higher ed, and I know you all have worked tirelessly to, to do a lot for us, and, um, and we appreciate all that you've done. I, I know we only know a little bit of it, and I think a part of the reason we want to have these town halls is to learn about all of the things that are, that are happening. Uh, that said, we're here to discuss what's happening at the university. I know there are plans about how to operate while we're under the stay-at-home order, how we're going to return to campus, and how to balance the new challenges that we face during this um, unprecedented economic recession. And so we're here to listen to your vision, understand your decisions, and provide some feedback on where we're headed. Uh, so that people understand, here's our plan. We're going to start with a presentation by the president and the provost. Uh, after that, Matt and Julie and I have a few questions to get the conversation started. I'll regularly be checking for questions in the chat box. We have several al already. We hope everybody will put those in there. We're going to try to get as many of those asked and answered as we can. Um, so we'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Golden and the provost, who have a few slides. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started with um, in just a second, you know, this is the continuity of the town halls, which we committed ourselves to, which I was doing um, earlier in the year before the pandemic. We want to continue. I'm sure governance dictates that we be transparent and that we work together and to make good informed decisions. And we can't do that unless you have as much information as possible. So that's the focus of these town halls. They will continue uh, throughout. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to dive into really the budget aspects of where we're at and where we think we're going. And the provost will talk about kind of starting up with the campus and what we're looking at for fall. I think it's really important to take a step back right now and just um, just acknowledge and appreciate all the hard work of our faculty and staff. Certainly from a faculty perspective of being uh, so nimble and to pivot so quickly to be able to provide online education to our students has been remarkable. I do get a lot of emails from family and from students, and I have to say very, very little uh, emails or correspondence had any negative connotation with the online learning experience today, and you're to be commended. But in addition to the faculty, there are a lot of people on campus that have made incredible strides and done a lot of work to make sure that the student experience has been as strong as possible. IDA, MRC, online learning, care team, counseling, advising, um, our physical plant for making sure that the university continues to operate. Uh, to all of you, a right, heartfelt thank you, uh, truly, for all the work that you've been doing. So with that, why don't we go ahead and get to the first slides. I'm going to start off with really kind of a recap of where we're at. If Colton can move on to the next slide. There we are. So um, I have made a, a larger deck. I'm a faculty member at heart. And uh, the Senate president said probably Friday at 4 o'clock is not the best time for a professor to give a lecture on everything. So I'm trying to give it in a more succinct manner. We'll have plenty of time for conversation. So let me kind of talk about where we are at and what we've done. So we're currently in fiscal year 2020, which ends on June 30th of this year. Already, because of the pandemic, we have already uh, put forward a lot of money in unexpended expenditures. We refunded students and families for housing, for dining, for parking. We've had to invest uh, funds for IT. Uh, athletics has been devastated by about two thirds nationally of the money that the university has been getting from the NCAA was cut because of no March Madness. And it's important to remember that when I talk about giving refunds for students or athletics, we have many different pots of money at this university. And at a later date, I think it would be very advantageous for me and for the vice president for research, excuse me, for administration 
to give an overview of the different pots of money. Um, I'm working with my counterpart to see if some of those rules can be relaxed, and you'll understand why in a little bit. But those refunds come from different pots of money. We're able to sustain where we're at, and we made a promise to each of you to hold true to your positions um, without any uh, layoffs or furloughs during this fiscal year. And we want to continue that. I'll get to that in a second. But if we Cole puts up that slide, this is where we're going. So our current projections are for starting July 1st for the new fiscal year is $6.8 million tuition shortfall. That doesn't account for housing, anything that might happen in housing or athletics, et cetera. Primarily that 6.8% is uh, $6.8 million is due to a reduction in credit hours for incoming students. It's important to note first time student enrollment is actually up, including for the I-35 corridor. Our tuition shortfall is based on what's happening with our returning students. And a lot of that can be based on things like parents being laid off at, uh, from their jobs, students and families not knowing about the university and are we going to open up in this fall? So there are many uh, variables, but that's kind of a good place to be with enrollment first year up. And hopefully we'll be able to add some stability so that those students that haven't re-enrolled will re-enroll. So there's two scenarios. And this is where, as we have our discussions today, there are gonna be some unknowns. I know that all of us would like very definitive answers and I just don't have it for you yet, but we're gonna work through this as a group. We have two dynamics that are happening. We know that we have that 6.8 million shortfall. Now, we also received 4.4 million as part of an $8.8 .8 million stimulus from the CARES, from the federal government. We are about to send off as soon as we receive those funds for the students, and we need to get those funds in the students' hands as soon as possible. The other half, the other 4.4 is the institutional portion. The Department of Education has not provided any guidance on that yet at all. So we don't know how we can apply that 4.4, but if we're able to use it for part of our projection shortfall, then we lower it to 2.4 million. And then that could even get lower if enrollment gets better, if there's another federal stimulus, um, and that the economy rebounds even stronger than projected. So we can go from a 6.8 to potentially 2.4 or lower. That's the optimistic side of me. On the other side, we have these dynamics. One, we don't know for sure what's gonna happen with the pandemic. Two, we're waiting to hear what's gonna happen with state budget. We already know for the current fiscal year, because the last few months of the shutdown, the state is now projecting 11% or about $827 million state shortfall. And then for next year, fiscal year 2021, where we're projecting a 6.8 million shortfall, the state is projecting 5.8% or about 445 million. They expect that eventually in 2021, the economy will reopen up and the economy will get stronger. The state does have some surplus. So far, the state has already done their budget for fiscal year 2021. Why is that important? Well, right now they're not planning on coming back into a session. So that means they would probably delay any across the board cuts to state agencies, including universities. That is beneficial for us because we hope that the economy does rebound Potentially there's gonna be another stimulus that happens that could go to the states. So that could um, diminish that shortfall and not require budget cuts. But if those things don't happen, that 6.8 million tuition shortfall and our budget shortfall could actually become larger if the state does across the board cuts or does targeted cuts where they might hold K through 12 steady and say higher education, you're gonna have a bigger proportion of cut Enrollment could get worse, the economy could get weaker. These are all things we know. For us to start making decisions though, we've already done certain things. We've done a hiring freeze, including travel, uh, discretionary spending holding. To do something like a furlough, which I'll talk about later, is it's fairly premature and it's a measure I'm not ready to uh, take right yet. There are some issues though, 
one of which is there is federal unemployment under the stimulus that expires July 31st. And that could be very important if we had to do a furlough for many of our staff. So those are a lot of dynamics at play. And we'll keep talking about it briefly. If we can go to the next slide and I'll move forward. Okay, so I talked about we have different pots of money as we try to do mitigation strategies. By statute, we have to balance our budget. There's no way around that. We need to continue the best student experience from education on campus, counseling, et cetera. I personally want to uh, minimize any adverse impacts to our campus family. And then we have a variety of regulations and policies that we have to comply with. It's not as easy as saying, well, why don't you stop doing this for this project? Because we have different obligations with um, different constituencies. And then we have to comply with contractual obligations. Those could be from donors, could be with personnel, could be with contractors, et cetera. Not that we can't get out of some of those, um, but that would incur additional costs with litigation potentially. All right, next slide. So the different strategies, I already talked about those that are in green, the first two being a hiring freeze or frost um, and also discretionary spending holding. We're doing that now to try to minimize the impacts for the next fiscal year. We're estimating right now about 1.5 to 2% across campus budget reductions. We are working to get that lower, but as I just showed you and talked about with the unknowns, we're also going to ask our units to start planning for larger reductions. Not that we need to implement it, but we need to think about that. Uh, we need to be prepared. Right now, potentially, this has not been finalized by any means because we are very concerned and I'm very concerned with um, the families that are going to be attending Wichita State now and also in the future to really hold them as uh, harmless as possible. But right now, in certain budget numbers, we're looking at about a total of 2.2 tuition fee increase, which would be about $90, less than $90 per semester. Um, that Wichita State University would still be the most affordable research university in Kansas and one of the most affordable for our peers and those in the region. And last would be the furloughs and salary cuts, maybe early retirements. That's if it's required. I talked about timings can be important. So those are the scenarios and things that we're thinking through. Go to the next slide. How are we going to do this? What's the approach? We're talking about shared governance. We're doing the town hall today. It's important that we keep the campus updated um, with this information, with drivers, and by drivers, I mean policies, what's happening in Topeka, federally, other, other implications. Um, we're going to do these town halls and meet on a regular basis. Important to note, we have engaged the Campus Budget Advisory Council, and Faculty Senate has representation on that as well from their uh, budget programs. The scenarios I just talked about, the numbers as they start changing and evolving, which happen on a daily basis, we're gonna keep that Budget Advisory Council, which is faculty, staff, and student representation, as well as administration, to think through and make recommendations. Some of these recommendations are, at my request, are being made, I've asked our division VPs and our deans to ensure that they engage both their faculty and staff to think through if it's a 1.5, 2% or lower across the board cuts, ways that can, that can be done most effectively and appropriately for each of those units. And then take those suggestions to the Budget Advisory Council. We need to have some, um, consistency in some rules, regulations, HR, et cetera. And so we want to make sure that those are bounced off appropriately. And then personally, I'm trying as well as the provost to engage the various um, constituent heads, the Senate presidents, uh, them to provide input, guidance, suggestion, feedback, what their, uh, what their constituencies are providing and for us to think through where we're at. I just want to be very clear on this. None of these decisions are great. Uh, we are fortunate. We're in a much, much better situation than both other universities in Kansas and across the nation. Um, we have seen some universities which are facing up to a quarter of a billion dollar shortfall. But ultimately we have to make decisions that are based on both the near term and the long term stability of this institution. We continue to work. I think, you know, we've seen a lot of institutions which have stopped. Higher education in Wichita State University specifically 
have continued to provide education, continued to provide counseling, mental health support, all the things that our students expect and working with the community on things that the community needs from more course development to uh, economic development. We are continuing to work. We are going to address these issues. We are going to overcome these issues and we'll be, be stronger at the end when we come out of it. And we will continue to think through what are the things that are going to move this institution forward at six months, a year, six years down the road. And we're going to continue to do that work collectively. It's important for us, it's important for our students, and it's important for our community. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the provost who's going to talk about what we're thinking and moving forward in regards to reintegrating the campus. Thank you, President Golden. Hello, everybody. Uh, I wish I could see you in person. Um, uh, it's good to be here today to talk a little bit about what we're doing and, and um, how we're going to move forward. I, I, before I move forward in my presentation today, I'd like to just give a shout out to everybody on campus, um, faculty, staff, students who have really stepped up and um, moved uh, the university forward in a fairly disruptive way. And, um, we haven't had any major issues. Um, we a uh, special shout out to the folks in the Media Resources Center and Instructional Design Office who have done an outstanding job to help faculty to transition their coursework and, and also in many other different ways. Um, and then all the other folks who are, who are working very hard at home um, in the various functional offices on campus, keeping the business of our university moving forward. Um, I can't thank you enough for that work, uh, and I know how difficult it's been in some cases. So if you go to the next slide, um, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about where we are in terms of reopening the campus. And uh, I, I've been talking about this um, with various groups, with the Faculty Senate Executive Team, with the deans and other folks across campus. We have a, 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 a tri-weekly check-in call with the various folks in academic affairs and other offices across campus. And, We've been talking about this for a couple of weeks just to, to see where we were on the possibility of reopening the campus. And, and what I've been hearing and um, from faculty and other folks is that we're, we're gonna have to open at some point. Um, and I don't take this lightly. I'm a healthcare provider myself. I'm a public health practitioner. Um, and, and I know um, the issues that we face but we're going to have to come to grips with the fact that we're going to be living in a new normal, uh, particularly dealing with a virus where there's no treatment and there's no vaccine. So we can't be paralyzed. We're gonna to have to figure out a way to coexist with the virus and the issues that that brings to us. And so, you know, from the, in the summer semester, we've already decided that we would remain um, uh, our coursework in uh, online or remote format. Um, so that's already underway and folks are preparing for that. And just so you know, the summer had primarily been um, uh, coursework that was in the online format already. So uh, although there's some additional courses that are going to have to move to a distant or online or remote format, um, the majority of our courses were already in that format um, already. Um, in terms of the fall and coming back to campus, um, as you know, many of you know that the Central County um, order, um, I believe, is scheduled to uh, lapse today. Um, and, I, and I haven't heard whether that's going to be continued. The governor's order expires at the end of the day on Monday. We'd always told the campus um, and promised the campus that we'd give at least a couple of weeks notice before we move back. Um, uh, to campus. And so that takes us right before Memorial Day. We thought the Tuesday after Memorial Day would be a good time to um, start phasing in um, opening of our offices. If anything changes, um, the, the, the stay at home orders are uh, uh, continued. We will obviously um, follow those and, and, and take the lead from the public health officials who are, who are making those decisions. But even if that happens, we need to continue planning for how we're going to uh, get back to the campus, get our offices opened up um, and making plans for the fall. Um, I'll talk about a little bit more of uh, specifics on health and safety in, in just a second. But in terms of the fall, 
we're, we're planning for the campus to be open to faculty, staff, and students. Um, that'll be necessary to determine how courses should be modified, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, and then um, students will also in, in be residing in the residence halls. There will be some health and safety issues that we're going to have to work through. Um, I, I do want to let you know that um, the Kansas Board of Regents is exploring the possibility of allowing us to alter our um, academic schedule, the possibility of not having a fall break, um, having classes um, uh, offered in different ways, um, maybe potentially uh, uh, the, the, the semester will end earlier than it, than it is currently scheduled. Um, but we'll, we'll talk through that as, as time goes on. Can you go to the next slide? So in order to help move us forward in this, um, we've established seven working groups and, um, and what they're doing now is developing reintegration plans in preparation to open the campus on the 26th. It's got representation of faculty, staff, and students. So you'll see here the different uh, uh, committees, task forces, work groups, whatever you want to call it, uh, with the leads on that. Um, and you'll notice that a lot of those are in academic affairs. We also have folks in, in research and uh, innovation campus area and then our strategic communications office. Um, let's talk a little bit about health and safety. So that's probably the most important area that we need to solve before we actually start uh, transitioning back to campus. We're following the federal plan that's been outlined by our government, um, which has three different phases. Um, and so what we're doing right now is talking to various folks about what's needed to, to move back to campus. Um, uh, is if you read that federal plan, which is uh, available um, in just searching that on the internet, you'll see that um, in order to start integrating back to campus, there has to be some evidence that there is some uh, lessening of the of infection rates um, and actually a movement of flattening the curve. Um, so we're paying very close attention to that. We're also needing having a better understanding of what would be we'd be doing with people who come back to campus to making sure that they're well um, so looking at uh, per, uh, personal protective equipment uh, checking temperatures checking someone's overall wellness is going to be very important as we work through so we have a whole group of people working on that representing academic affairs student affairs um, housing campus police the physical plant. We're also looking at cleanliness of buildings and disinfection, disinfecting the buildings. So lots of different issues um, that we're going to have to work out there. And I've given all of these groups until next Friday to give us a general outline of how they're going to move forward. If you could put that slide back up. I appreciate it. And so the, the, the next committee or the work group is the campus activities, classroom activities, um, uh, spaces across campus um, and they're working at looking at uh, the physical distancing issues, how many people can be in a room and what kinds of things are needed along those lines. Um, and so that, that's being led by a registrar and David Wright. We've also recently looked at classroom utilization and we know that we have spaces that we can spread out if we need to. In terms of um, Faculty curricular design, uh, Carolyn Shaw and a whole group of faculty are looking at how we might move forward in that. And if you looked at an article this week by Inside Higher Education, it's a really good article about um, how we might want to think about moving forward. And that's everything from online, which we're familiar with. It could also be front loading some of the content earlier in the semester. If we're worried about having too many people who can't physical distance in a class, it may mean offering the course, for example, a Tuesday and Thursday course where a third of the students meet on Tuesday, a third of the students meet on Thursday, and a third of the students are doing something online. So there's all those kinds of options that are available. What I want to get away from is um, as we move forward, particularly closer to the fall semester, I want to get away from us having to make a decision telling you this is what you need to do. I'd much rather you tell us how we can learn to offer things differently and, and, and coexist with this virus and the new normal that we're faced with. Um, I think that would be more satisfying to faculty, um, maybe less disappointment. 
um, if, if we have to make something happen to you versus you help us make a decision how we move forward. So that's going to be a very key uh, a group that will be offering recommendations and advice moving forward. We also have a lot of issues around student finances, not only the fact that students are hurting during this um, and many of their families as well. Um, so, you know, we do have some extra resources to give to students through the CARES Act, um, but also having students understand why we're charging fees, why we're uh, charging the tuition rates that we're, we're charging, making it, having them have a better understanding of, um, of why those are still necessary. And so there's a group that's come together, student affairs, academic affairs, um, various other places across campus to try to come up with some messaging for students around that. Um, of course, research is important to us as a research institution and Dr. Colin Pugh, who's the ABP for research and Dean of the Graduate School, is already has a good process that she went through when we actually went to a remote um, working situation. And now she's reversing that and doing some um, updates to that and various folks who are involved in research are working in that. Our innovation partners are important to consider. As you know, we have a lot of businesses that are located on our campus. We want to make sure they're in sync with us and we're in sync with them and they're doing similar things to us. We don't want us, uh, our, our campus to be doing one thing and, and their employees doing something different. And then uh, we mix and, and, it, and there's probably not a lot of good that would come out of that. So Tanya Witherspoon and her team are, is leading that particular um, work group. And then finally, the most important thing here really is how we communicate this to the campus. Um, we've heard things that people feel like it's dangerous for us to think about coming back on May 26. But again, we're following our fe the federal plan. We're following the local planning uh, documents that our uh, a county is putting together and, this, and, the, and the local plans that, uh, further beyond that, as well as the state plan. So um, we're not doing anything that is out of the ordinary, we're just trying to be uh, 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 making good decisions about how we move forward. Um, and so communicating that to the campus is going to be key um, as we move towards moving back to campus. So that's the, uh, the plan in a nutshell. Um, be happy to answer any questions. I, I believe Jeff uh, is going to uh, do those later on in the session. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you both for, for those presentations. Our plan is to start with some questions about the budget and then finish the session with some questions about return to campus. And I think Matt's got a first question related to the budget. Yes, thank you. Um, does the university foresee any actions um, if, if there are furloughs, layoffs, or any salary cuts for fiscal year 21? I'll, I'll, I'll take that, Matt. Thank you. So. You know, I showed that $6.8 million shortfall. I have confidence that we can work through as a university community, both with the actions we've already taken with the request to reduce the budget across the board by about one and a half to 2% that we won't have to do furloughs. And that's the path where I'm really trying to have us move forward on. But I, I need to be very transparent with the campus. You know, the unknown, if enrollment were to really tank, that would be one issue. If the state and the governor comes back and says higher education has to take a, a budget cut, um, that could precipitate it. I personally am hopeful that the legislators and the governor will wait till around January to see what has happened and transpired to understand because we have federal stimulus coming the economy could pick back up. Don't forget, folks. And I'm not I'm not pushing one political party versus the other, but we we do have elections in November, and those elections have consequences potentially for us. Uh, so all those things are at play. The plan right now, and again, we're engaging as part of shared governance, the budget advisory council, is to try to move forward in every fashion plan. Right now, we don't anticipate furloughs. But I just we, we just don't know because we don't know what action the state and feds will take. 
Great, thanks. Julie, I think, uh, has a question as well. Yeah, so prior to the economic disruption um, caused by COVID, the university had some plans in place where they were talking about in the next um, fiscal year budget to continue addressing employees who are below market pay mm -hmm. and provide them with base pay increases as part of a multi-year process. Last year, you were able to start with faculty and I think staff were potentially gonna be coming on board this year. Can you talk about those efforts and where they stand now um, in light of the economic crisis for FY21? I can answer that question. So um, yes, we um, had put that uh, uh, as a priority in the budget planning. Right now it is not in the mandatory um, uh, funding section of those plans. Um, obviously that's disappointing to, to me because we spent so much effort um, uh, doing this with faculty first and then staff. Um, you know, there is always a chance, um, you know, particularly if our enrollment um, uh, improves um, or does it comes in above from what we were what we're projecting. It's a possible possibility to add that back in. Um, but right now it's been taken off the table. And, and I'm going to just get it right through. The promise said something very important. You know, we don't have control over what the state does. We do have to a certain extent control over enrollment. And to the extent as a campus, we can come together. We can have a very positive outward facing that we're, we're, we're prepared. We're ready to, for our students to come back um, for our deans, our chairs, and our faculty to reach out to the prospective students, strategic enrollment group, I am, we're reaching out to the students and, do, and families doing uh, virtual town halls with them as well. The, the optics are very important. We want to be prepared and we want to be truthful in what we're saying to them. So the most more that we can do to have this campus open in a very safe and uh, positive way is going to be important for our institution. A uh, bunch of questions on the budget in the chat box. I guess I'll use this as a time to tell people, keep typing them in. We're going to try to get all of these asked. There's a question about uh, the hiring freeze and if um, we have any idea when that might be lifted. Well, so first of all, I, I, I keep being reminded it's a hiring frost, not a freeze. But um, so there are some, first of all, let me say there's some exceptions, right? So health and safety and compliance, um, we, we still need to move forward on those. And there may be some other key positions, including grants, uh, individuals are on grants, different pots of money. Right now, we're kind of in a wait and see, Jeff, and whoever asked that question. We need to um, keep it in place to ensure that we can meet our budget and then the variables as to what happens with the state, with enrollment, those type of things. If we move more to the left of my slide where we have the better scenario, then those type of restrictions will be eased up a bit. But it's just way too early to tell. So for the near term, they continue. A couple of questions about the federal stimulus money, both for student side and non-student side. I want to get both of those asked. I know you, you, you talked about this a little bit, maybe to add a little more detail to that. Uh, on, on the student side, do we know when that aid will be available to students and how they'd be able to apply for that? Yeah, let me jump in for part of it and then the provost will jump in. God bless the federal government because with every gift requires a lot of paperwork that needs to be filled out. And across the country, less than half the institutions have actually did, uh, sent in their application. But WSU and WSU Tech did that. We did it last week. We've been told that we should be receiving the money probably within 12 days of doing that. Uh, but there's only been a couple of universities that received funds. We, the purpose of that is to get those funds into Pell eligible students' hands ASAP, to get it back in the economy. We, there's no requirement for them to um, fill out the application. There's no requirement to tell, have them tell us how they're going to use those funds. International students, doc, uh, dreamers are not allowed to access those funds for working with the foundation for that 4.4. Different universities have different approaches right now. We're trying to be a little bit more consistent, but most of it needs to go out ASAP into these camps. I don't know if the provost has other you want to add. Well, I'll just add that, um, so in the interim, uh, while we're waiting on those federal funds, we have raised quite a bit of money through the foundation um, to award students who are in need, and, and they've given out several of those awards. Julie probably knows the exact number. 
And so we're going to continue to do that and follow that at least initially. And then when we do get the money, we'll be able to bridge into that um, for um, extra uh, assistance to students. So Julie, you might want to say something more about it because you work in financial aid. <laughs> Thanks for lobbing that over to me. Um, we've awarded well over 100 students um, the funds that are coming into the foundation, and I really want to commend faculty and staff. Um, not only our community has donated to that fund, but faculty and staff have been noted as donating to that fund as well, and so that's going to really help offset some expenses for students in the immediate future. Um, students can apply for that at wichita.edu slash finaid COVID-19. There's an application out there for them to continue submitting those applications if they're experiencing some financial hardships. And then Jeff, real briefly, on the other half, the other 4.4 million, which is the institutional, yeah. it wasn't until late last week, or maybe even this week, it's a blur right now, um, that actually the Department of Education put out the uh, application process. We're submitting that application process. There has not been any guidance from the federal government Department of Education and how those funds could be used. If we had full discretion, that 4.4 would help drop our $6.8 million shortfall to $2.4 million. We're just waiting to hear, and as soon as we hear, we will broadcast to let everybody know. You know, I think kind of the question, I, I think we've all heard in various places that there hasn't been a lot of direction on that. I guess the question maybe was, in a, in a good case, what are the kinds of things we might be able to use that money for? If it was super narrow, do we have any idea what that could go for? I, we're still trying to evaluate it. I mean, I, I don't want to give hypotheses on right. it because we just, the guidance, I don't know. Yeah, there's a couple of things that, that, that have been mentioned, and that's the expensive that, that we needed to incur to move to online uh, remote format, you know, like buying laptops, Chromebooks, hotspots, those sorts of things. Um, so we know that that's been mentioned in, in some of the narrative that we read. Uh, one other for sure question uh, on the budget side, there's a question about um, staff and faculty paying fees for parking still, even though we were um, not allowed to come to the campus. Was there any discussion about refunding or not charging faculty and staff for those parking fees? Well, you want me to answer that? Absolutely. I think okay. I think the person who asked it probably wants you, yeah. So yeah, so we had lots of conversations about parking. Um, uh, we already made a decision uh, a while back that we weren't going to refund um, any of the faculty and staff who are paying for parking on campus. They're still getting paid. They still have access to campus, although we want them to stay away as much as possible, but they still have access to campus. We still have the infrastructure to pay for it. Um, the reality is if someone wanted to stop paying for their parking, they could go do that um, through financial operations if, uh, if, if that was an issue to them. And it wasn't a lot of money concern, uh, considering how where we were in the fiscal year in terms of making those refunds. There's a question on the chat about the flats and suites, and I think Matt has a question about that too. So maybe we'll toss it back to him. Sure. Yeah. Um, after last week's cable meeting, it was announced um, with the when when do the is the purchase going to go through for the two buildings? And are they full now? And is there going to be any social distancing guidelines set up for the tenants in those buildings? Sure, great question. Um, so we received KBAR authorization. Um, we, for this coming fiscal year, fiscal year 2021, we anticipate the difference, the savings from what we have to pay for leasing it. And we would always have to pay to lease it if a third party owned it. That was the initiative. A, a company out of uh, Boston was trying to buy it from the developer, and we had first prior refusal. And so if we want to maintain our residence halls in the middle of our campus for our students to live and not permit the campus to live in the dorms, we had to buy it. We're, it was very fortuitous because the interest rate now is all-time low, 2.75%. So we are the difference between just for this year of saving from what we paid a lease to our bond payment is about six hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and we know there'd be two percent escalated 
And if it told that that company could have sold it to another company in another country, it could keep going up. And we're locked in for 25 years. Our plan is to purchase, uh, to go through the bonding um, this year before August. And um, I think the, so we are going to continue our savings. Again, remember different pots of the money and remember that we had to spend about $2.7 million to get housing refunds. So that will help replenish some of those funds in case of another emergency. Um, the other part was the question of a full. My understanding is the flats, I believe it's the flats, might be the flats is already full um, and the suites is closed, but not yet. And we are thinking about, and as the provost has talked about earlier, um, as a campus and with expert input, we're going to be providing uh, scenarios where do we have to have some area, some uh, floors maybe open in case we need to self-isolate someone looks like they're sick just to be in there for self-quarantine. A lot of scenarios to play with. But uh, actually, we in K-State, surprisingly, uh, deposits are up for housing. I, th I think the question in the chat was also got at um, where are we in the process? So is the, are we for sure going to, to buy those facilities? And I guess to your point about our contractual obligation, our, do we have a fixed cost whether we own it or not? Whether, you know, whether there's one in a dorm room or? Yeah, well, unless we, want, unless we want to say no, we're going to allow anybody from anywhere to live in the middle of our campus with our students. We're, we're contractually obligated. We will have to lease all of it. And as I just demonstrated, um, just this year alone, we're going to save $650,000. So yes, we are moving forward with it for all the right purposes, including, don't forget, we're an institute for higher learning. And there's a lot of literature that shows students that live in, on campus have a higher GPA, are more likely to graduate on time. They have access to our counselors, to people living in the dorms. They are so. There's a lot of reasons that it's the appropriate thing to do. Thanks, um, Julie. Anything else on the budget you want to ask? Yeah, just kind of a follow up on some of the larger budget items that are starting to get discussed and were discussed last week at KBOR. Um, for instance, in the past couple of weeks, there's been significant discussion about building um, some additional building projects at the university in the future. Um, those included raising Cessna Stadium and then plans for the Convergent Sciences buildings. Um, and Dr. Golden, I think in one meeting recently, you likened the strategic planning process to a game of chess where you really have to be thinking several steps ahead. What's your opponent going to be doing? How do you position for the future? So can you talk about that future planning and how we reconcile as an institution budget cuts in the present and then significant financial expenditures in the future? Sure. So I am a systems engineer, so I always think like in chess games. So it's, I, I smiled when the stadium came up. I want to tell the campus community that is not high on the priority. We're not trying to tear it down right away, et cetera. It, but if a donor came up to any one of us and said, here's X number of million dollars to tear it down and rebuild it, we certainly, as I said, different pots of money. We're not going to turn it down. But we're not actively doing that. That was something that got started earlier. We had, under shared governance, I keep coming back to that, we have a task force, we have an athletic task force. That was part of the request for them to evaluate that. I checked with one of the co-chairs the day before the table or yes, move forward with getting the authorization, which we could do in, in the future, but don't start focusing on trying to get raise money for that this time. So not. Convergent sciences and digital transformation. Um, let me talk about that just briefly. The state legislature, another university was authorized, or another university had put in for um, $5 million of funding for a program. And the legislators reached out to us and said, well, Wichita State University should also be at the table um, because we think the work that you're doing as the innovation university is important. So we put together the proposal under the convergent sciences and get the broad, but under digital transformation, uh, which spans everything from humanities, math, business, engineering, et cetera. Because I'm never going to turn down an opportunity to get $5 million for faculty, staff, and students, because those funds could be used for grad students, undergrad students, et cetera. 
So we, even though I know the optics are difficult at a time of budget, um, they, the legislators asked us to get cable approval to put it forward as an idea. Likely not can get funded this year, but it, it's in the queue, it's approved, and maybe two, two moves down the road, right? Fiscal year 2022, when they're trying to get the economy going, we might be in line for that because it's approved. The buildings. We're considering NIAR kind of convergent sciences one, then there's convergent science two and three in theory. Let me take three first. Three is a, uh, it's a concept that as our faculty have been working on convergent science uh, proposals that uh, would house uh, our campus and it could have other amenities in, in there too, other locations, potentially a place for a faculty um, um, break room, I don't want to call it, restaurant, whatever you want to call it, um, areas for staff or grad students, but where we can bring uh, staff and faculty from different programs together on the main campus, not the innovation campus, if you will. Uh, that's predicated on us getting funding for a program. That's predicated for getting on the capital projects, but it's something we would like to do because uh, it's important. Uh, but we're not committing any funds to that right now. Convergent Science 2, which is digital transformation, that's part of uh, on the innovation campus, and again, different pots of money. NetApp is moving on. Um, that's you know 600 employees. They've already have a presence. Um, there are some other companies, global companies, can be here offering opportunities for research and for uh, applied learning experiences. We have a uh, couple entities. In, for a later date, WSIA, as well as the mill levies, that's not different pots of funds that could potentially be used. There have been no decisions on that. Um, but we will have, we will continue moving forward with uh, evaluating that, and we will have discussions with leadership if that's what we should be doing. It, it's, it's important to just know that we need to be prepared. We need the university to continue moving forward. But again, you've already heard, we want to balance that. We, I don't want to do furloughs, and I don't want bigger budget cuts than we need. So we're going to balance it, but we, I want us to keep thinking about how do we move this university forward together. All right, we have a lot of questions about uh, return to campus. I think that's on people's minds. Uh, so we're going to transition and get a couple in that area as well. And Julie, I think, has one to lead us off. Yeah, kind of. Um, can you tell us some of the institutions that you're in communication with in terms of sharing the best practices for reopening campus? You know, who else are we talking to, even not just within KBOR, but who else outside of Kansas might we be chatting with? Um, and what guidelines and experts are you listening to that are going to help shape the reopening of Wichita State both this summer and the fall? Let's share this. I'll start briefly and let the provost give a longer answer. So I want the community to know that I'm in contact. Kate will start this. So this, and they call us CEO, presidents, chancellor. Uh, every uh, at least twice a week, we're on webinars like this, sharing best management practices, having third parties come on to talk to us about moving forward. Um, those uh, APLU, there was a call of all the presidents and chancellors, and that's ongoing, where we're sharing these best management practices and ideas and concerns. Folks should know it. Texas has opened up. I think it's next week at the University of Houston system and other Texas universities. So we're going to be tracking what other institutions are doing and how they're doing it. The private sector is also a very big part of this. Uh, industry is uh, ramping up in manufacturing and others. They have a lot of environmental health and safety expertise that they're sharing and they've been stepping up. They've been working with both WSU Tech and uh, our own university. So we're really trying to reach out and we're trying to bring community members, uh, partners within higher education as well as health uh, officials. And I'll let the provost uh, give a little more detail. Yeah, um, uh, I've been noticing all the, the questions about this and uh, a couple of things. So uh, to follow up with what um, President Golden was saying. So just this morning, I met with um, all the provosts in the, in the Kansas um, Board of Regents uh, system, universities, to talk just about this and how, how each of us were thinking about opening up. Um, it's not hard to find out information on this. Um, obviously, there's a federal plan, there's a local plan, there's a state plan. And then as, as me as a healthcare provider, I'm, I'm evaluating, looking at things on a daily basis. 
makes sense. I, I want just looking at some of the comments, I want everybody to understand something very clearly. Yes, we're going to open up, but we're going to do it in a safe way. One of the things that we don't, um, that we didn't have when we closed down is a lot of information that's out there now. Um, we, we didn't know what was actually uh, expected of us. And we didn't know what we needed to do in terms of disinfecting buildings. We didn't know a lot of things that, that are widely available and, and are being discussed widely. And we're gonna follow each one of those guidelines. And there were some comments uh, on the chat about what folks who are uh, immunocompromised um, have um, families or, or different kind of personal situations that will prevent them from coming back. We're going to work with everybody to make sure that we do this in a phased fashion. There will be people, and that's part of the federal plan and local plan, state plan, is to continue to have staggered work schedules, to continue to encourage teleworking as much as possible. Um, so we're not just jumping into this and, and um, haphazardly thinking about doing this. There's been questions and raised on the chat about PPE and who's going to be providing that. So right now we're uh, going through a process to determine what we actually will need. You know, face masks, face shields, partitions, um, temp thermometers, uh, various other kinds of things, hand sanitizer. Um, so we're taking an inventory of what we, we, what we have, what we would need, um, and um, at this point, the university will be providing most of that um, to our campus and the students. We don't want to put an extra burden on, on that for the employees and the students. Um, so, but I do want to tell you that we're going through this in a very methodical, um, careful, restrained way. We're not rushing to in, into anything. Rick, if I could follow up on that, I think a lot of the, you're right, the questions are about what kind of what about, what about, some of those logistics questions, and it might be early to, to know for sure, but as you think about a, a staggered approach and phasing this in, how long do you anticipate that stagger to be? I mean, do you think we'd be at full staff and faculty on the campus even in the fall? I, I think... Um, just what I'm reading, what I'm hearing, I think we're going to be in a sort of a staggered situation probably for the foreseeable future. Um, but we're going to be open where people can come to campus physically. Um, so, and that just depends on, um, uh, you know, the burden of the disease in the community. Right now, um, we have over 300 cases and we have community spread. That's of concern. Um, we're doing more testing now as well. So that that's uh, uh, opening up um, that information to the community. So um, it's, it's hard to, to say, Jeff, how long that's going to take, but it, we're going to take however long we need to is, would be the answer for that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's going to be a difference in what we've been doing before. It's not going to be like turning on a light switch and oh, everybody show up at work on the 26th. It's not going to be that way at all. Yeah, no, I think the questions are concerns about, I think, rooted in, in an anxiety that people might have to come back to campus. And I think people might like to hear that, that for some people, we know that there'll be staggered work schedules and they might not be back for a while. Yeah, and, and as more information comes together, as these work groups continue to work on um, some of their plans, we'll, we'll have more information to share as we go through the, the process. And, 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 in the chat, I promised one person I'd ask her a question, so I better do that before we get to five o'clock. There's a question about why we're reopening right after Memorial Day. If everybody's traveling for Memorial Day, shouldn't we wait two weeks after that before we start phasing people back onto the campus? Why are you traveling? Hmm. Yeah, so uh, I uh, just follow up with what Jay just, the question, the rhetorical question that he posed there is that um, if you look at the federal plans and you look at the local plans, state plans, um, they're not recommending people to travel. Um, uh, so uh, that's something that we're going to be communicating to the campus. Um, we're not going to be traveling in, in any way that's non-essential. Um, it, it sounds like that would be an obvious thing to do, but I think most people are probably not going to travel. Um, we're not probably going to go on a big vacation over Memorial Day and congregate around a lake and barbecues and that sort of thing. And certainly that's not something that we're that any public official is encouraging at this point. 
Uh, there, a couple, we've talked about faculty and staff as it's kind of all one big group, but there's some, there's a question on there about RSC employees and whether they'd return under the same schedule or not. So each of the divisional vice presidents, the RSC reports up to the student affairs will be making their own plans and we'll, we'll all be following the same kind of processes. And, and so there'll also be some staggered um, uh, schedules for that uh, particular organization. There is some extra careful concern that goes into the RSC because that's where a lot of food services are located. That's where congregation space is. And so there may be a situation in the RSC that there's places that are roped off where, or the furniture is taken out and distance so people can um, uh, physical distance more easily. Um, so, um, uh, but yes, the campus will be doing the same thing in terms of how we uh, uh, migrate back to campus. Yeah. And Chuck, there's, there's a question I accumulate recently, what's going to happen with athletics? And the answer is, um, you know, you have different uh, regulations and rules that are being promulgated by different communities that received by the conference that the NCA is going to do, so it's way too early to tell what's going to happen. Uh, there's a question of concern, I guess, about as uh, things start to get better, what happens if um, we backslide as a community? Uh, any, any sense of what closing again might be like for the campus? Well, I'll, I'll step in there. So um, I, I don't want to say that that's not going to happen, um, certainly, um, because that's anything's possible. But again, as I said earlier, um, we know a lot more about what we need to do as a community um, in Wichita, Sedgwick County, but also here at Wichita State. Um, if um, there are policies that are put in place that don't protect the health and safety of individuals, that's there's a good chance that that could happen. But I don't see that happening in this county, and I don't see it happening in the state. So, again, if 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 we have to do something drastic. Uh, um, we would be prepared to do that. But I, again, I think that's um, remote. And you have to understand when you're looking at um, uh, this disease and looking at our entire country, there's regional differences. Um, obviously, the, the burden of disease in our state is not like New York or Washington State or Louisiana, although we have had some uptick in cases. Um, and that's going to be all taken into consideration as we work through this. But again, we're going to do it in a strategic way. We're going to listen to our uh, community partners. We're going to do the right thing and make sure that people are protected. And, and there's a lot of venues for people. They have real concerns that we want to know about it. So certainly with their supervisors, certainly with their Senate representatives, directly contacting the VPs or myself, um, please let us know because we want to address them. Yeah, I think that really gets at the comments that have been happening um, on, on the chat right now with people who are on the campus working and some concerns about social distancing as that happens there. So I yeah, we, we've, we've been hearing about some of those concerns and, and, and I, I have to tell you, I just wanna remind everybody that this is a real thing and this is something that we need to be engaging in. It's hard to do. Um, I find myself when I'm out walking around the neighborhood not uh, not worrying about that, but then you know, have to you know think. Okay, some, something different is going on. Um, it, it takes a while to come to grips with this, but it's important for everybody all across our campus, in our city, in the county, in the United States, to be engaging in this. This is what will help us um, lessen the disease burden as we go forward. All right, uh, we're getting close to our hour here. Any final comments, uh, President Golden, uh, Provost, that you'd like to say? I would just like to, again, thank everybody for all the hard work and dedication you put forward, not only just for our students, but for each other and for the community. This, it, these are very trying times, there is no doubt. Um, but we will, you know, if we stay positive, work together, communicate to one another, we're going to get through this stronger. Um, it's just going to, we just don't know how long it's going to take. But um, I ask for your support with each other as we navigate these. Yeah, I echo what President Golden has said as well. I really 
I can't tell you how much I appreciate the work that everybody has done and pulled together. Um, it's uh, beyond belief, really, for me. Um, when I think about what you all have done to make this transition and to keep the momentum momentum going um, is beyond impressive. Um, and I trust that you will let me know, like you always do, um, if you have issues that, that, that come about. And, and I'll, I'll make the, um, uh, again, the, the deal that I will be as transparent as possible and making sure that we communicate fully as we move forward. Well, uh, on behalf of all three of our senates, we want to thank you both for giving us your time this afternoon. I think we had over 700 people at one point watching. I know the return to campus, I think, will be our, our main topic at the town hall in the two weeks from now. And given even some last minute questions that are going on there about what we're going to do more specifically for people who have kind of return to work questions, we'll, we'll, sh we'll try to get all of those asked and, and answered in two weeks time. Yes, absolutely. All right. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you.